Thank you all for tuning in today to this panel on diversity inclusion issues in the asset management industry. Women and people of color are severely underrepresented in the asset management industry, particularly among the ranks of portfolio managers and executive leadership. Many firms have increased their focus on addressing this over the past year and a half, but the industry still has a long way to go. We've got a great group of panelists here to discuss this important topic. With us today is Jose Manaya, CEO of Nuveen. Jose also serves as the executive sponsor for the Inclusion and Diversity Initiative at TIAA, which aims to promote a diverse and inclusive environment throughout the company. We've got Rupal Bansali, Chief Investment Officer and Portfolio Manager of International and Global Equities at Aerial Investments. Rupal is also one of the 2% of female portfolio managers independently managing a mutual fund in the US. We've also got Seema Hingarani, Managing Director of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. Seema is also the founder and chair of Girls Who Invest, a nonprofit focused on increasing the number of women in portfolio management and executive leadership in the asset management industry. And finally, Juan Martinez, Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Treasurer of the Knight Foundation, which today released a research report on representation of asset management firms owned by women and racial and ethnic minorities on the manager rosters of the nation's largest charitable foundations. Before we get started, I'd like to remind the audience that you can submit questions through the chat box on your screen. To kick off this session, I'd like to ask each, each of our panelists for their insight on why it has taken the industry so long to address this issue. Are the steps firms are now taking, firms and investors now taking enough? Um, to get started, Juan, what are your thoughts on this? So thank you, Daniel. I, I appreciate the invitation, the opportunity to, to speak to this um, uh, uh, great, um, well, among this great panel and, and, uh, and to the audience. Um, so, I just sort of lay the groundwork with a couple of studies that Knight Foundation has done. So in 2017, Knight looked at overall um, uh, assets under management by women in diverse owned funds uh, on US-based assets. And that was about, and the kind of overall percentage was 0.9% was of all AUM. In, in 2019, we repeated that study and found that it was 1.3%. That's a, that's a, tiny percentage. Uh, some have asked, well, why did you look at, at ownership versus um, portfolio managers or folks within diversity within the investment management um, field or area specifically? And that's because that data is not, easy, not readily available and not uh, broadly available. So um, I would say that well, one of the things that I, that I see is that because that data isn't broadly available, it's hard to measure. It's hard, you know, and, and in, a, in, a, in a highly quantitative field like finance, uh, one thing that, that tends to be true is that you don't uh, get what you don't measure. Uh, so sort of lack of data is, is one thing. And then I think... Um, understanding the criteria that investment, that asset allocators use in order to make asset alloc uh, allocation decisions and what the basis is of those, whether it's preference or actual quantitative um, effect, I think is important. And I think asset allocators are just beginning to think, to ask themselves that question. Thanks, Juan. Rupal, what is your perspective on this? Well, uh, you know, the stats are not just ugly, they are embarrassing. I mean, less than 1.5% of assets in our $63 trillion industry managed by diverse firms. I mean, if that isn't the definition of tokenism, I don't know what is. But I think the question was, you know, why has it taken so long uh, to address this lack of diversity? I think it's because our industry has accepted excuses uh, as explanations. Uh, and we've settled for rhetoric in the form of speeches and pledges instead of results. So here's what I think people who want to walk the walk instead of just talking the talk can do. There was a CIO who had a vacant position uh, in his team. Uh, and so he told his team that he wanted to recruit a divorced person 
uh, and uh, you know gave them the mandate to do so. They went back for a couple of weeks and tried, and then they go back to the CIO and told him, well, can you relax this constraint, this condition, because you know we can't find anybody. So the CIO told the team, well, uh, that's all right, you know, uh, come back to me when you can. In the meantime, divvy up the work amongst yourselves. Uh, and, you know, when you recruit that person, uh, you can hand it off. Miraculously, they found a person the very next month, <laughs> a very capable divorced woman of color. So I think the reality is when it starts hurting you personally, that's when it becomes your problem and you suddenly develop a sense of urgency and intensity, you know, to fix it. So I think in my opinion, that's what it's gonna take. You know, can people actually have incentives and disincentives? And I think that sort of uh, agenda needs to be set by the top, just like the CIO did. Uh, and it's a question of setting targets and timelines and holding themselves and their managers accountable for missing or meeting them through a set of incentives and disincentives. Anything short of that will shortchange the industry and we'll be having the same panel over and over again unless that changes. So it's again to Juan's point, having metrics, having disclosure, making them measurable, making them meaningful, uh, that's what it's gonna take. Thanks. Jose, what are your thoughts on this? Why has it taken the industry so long to address these issues? And is it enough what firms are doing right now? You know, the interesting thing is uh, the industry has been aware of these issues for quite a while. And I would say, you know, across the organizations, across asset managers, there's been a will and an intent to, to, change, to change the dialogue here and, and, and to change the narrative. I think in, in it, it, what comes down here is two things, and Rupal hit on one of them. It's the sense of urgency, right? I think the reality is that the industry is now realizing this is a bottom line issue, right? Not just in terms of the profile of our clients and, and the demographics there. Um, firms who are not doing this well are quickly learning, you're not gonna get the capital if you don't do this. So that sense of urgency and alignment to the bottom line is critical. That's been slow to happen. Uh, and I do think now there's kind of more appreciation and acceleration behind it. I think the other thing, which is very typical of our industry, it's our process, right? We, we, I see it in the same thing with inclusive capital and kind of about what our investment process is. We typically stick to the same process. And I think you have to reimagine the process and figure out there are pools of talent out there. How do you get at them? For us, it was recognizing that while we got diverse slates of candidates, the people doing the interview were not diverse themselves. And there were often line managers that came in with their own biases. It's a realization that we needed to be more aggressive. So often you're saying, well, there's a lot, the turnover isn't big in the asset management space. Uh, and you know, on our end, we're growing. My viewpoint is we're not gonna go recruit based on a role, right? So we kind of, we flipped it and said, we're gonna engage with recruiters and others and say, we're looking for top talent. I don't, I don't know, we have roles available some are uh, designed today, some we will reimagine, but if you find me strong talent that is diverse, we're gonna reimagine kind of how we're staffed and what we do to bring that, to bring that talent in. And I think the last one has been, which has probably been the most effective, is you know, we often, the other thing we do with our process, we fish in the same pools. We go to the same schools, we go to the same associations. And to me, it was around how do we find broader pools and where we found our best pool was from uh, aligning our staff and our people and saying, you are our best recruiters and making that be part of their roles and bringing that in. And look, there's nothing like your own, your own employees to hold you accountable as they're bringing people in who they feel are talented in the industry and kind of saying, okay, well, why, if there's no traction there, why is there no traction? So big thing is urgency, which is a bottom line issue and that's gonna drive the urgency. And the rest of it is you have to change your process of the way things have been done for the last 50 plus years and how you go attract that talent. Thanks, Jose. And Seema, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, everything that's been said so far is uh, I completely agree with. Uh, and it's, uh, and by the way, thank you for inviting me to join this panel and, and be amongst friends here. I, I, I think you know, back in 2013, 2014, when I was the chief investment officer of the New York City Pension Funds, 
that was where I started asking the question of all the asset managers who were, who were then coming to meet with me. Um, and at the time, you know, I was managing a $160 billion portfolio along with our team and our trustees. So we're the fourth largest U.S. public pension plan uh, at that time and still today, I believe. Um, and so every asset manager come meet with me, sit down, you know, interested in managing, managing New York City's money, I get to the organizational chart and look down on it and say, oh my God, you guys, where are all the women on your investment team? Right, so back then I was asking it about it. Not a lot of LPs, I don't think we're asking those questions, certainly not the way they are now. You cannot get into a meeting with an LP without in the first five minutes them asking you what's going on here. Diversity on your investment teams, diversity in the senior levels, management, um, you know, promotion policies, retention policies. I mean, now we're getting a lot more detail, which frankly, I think is great. And uh, now that I've been at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, it's one of the things that we're working on, you know, with me there is, is we want to take a leadership position on being more transparent and providing this data and basically saying to our clients, hey, look, yeah, not so great right now, these numbers, but here's what we're doing to make them better. And here are our targets, because Rupal said this, we've got to put out targets. Oh, and by the way, uh, now hold us accountable. Um, and I think the whole industry needs to do that. We're not doing, we were not doing this, not even really talking about it as much, you know, seven, eight years ago. So lots happened, which is good. Um, you know, to Jose's point, Girls Who Invest in my starting that organization was because I saw what I saw in that CETA CIO. And then I heard from all the leaders of our industry pretty much that said the reason why SEMA is because we don't get resumes from women. You know, and of course, we know the women are out there. I knew the women were out there. It's just our industry, to Jose's point, was doing the same thing over and over again for decades in terms of how they were recruiting talent. They would go to these four colleges or five colleges to recruit, and they would go to two-year investment banking programs. And so as I learned more about that, I just I just asked them, I said, well, if that's what you're doing. No wonder you're having a problem with diversity. So let's go do the work, you know, but you had to do the work. And I found that at the time, they really didn't want to do the work. And so I did the work. So I started this nonprofit. I focused on college women to create this pipeline of amazingly talented women to go into our industry and stay in it for a long time. And we went to every college. I had an application process. We found, we find, we continue to find, we're in our sixth summer now, we continue to find gems across this country because we know they're out there. And that's what we're doing. And so if you look at the cohorts and, you know, in six years, we put nearly a thousand women through my college summer programs, both online and on campus. 60 to 70% of these women are staying in the investment business, getting multiple offers from something great from South there amongst many of us right here in the firms we're at. But, but importantly, the diversity of our cohorts of women is the most meaningful to me personally, especially. So these women come, over, come from over 60 different colleges across the United States. 25% of those schools are public universities. 20% of the women um, have identified as historically underrepresented minorities, so black women, Latina women, and we're gonna get better and better on that metric as well. And we're measuring all of this stuff, of course. 25% of the women identified as socioeconomically disadvantaged in over 50 different majors of study. So we're taking the English majors, the biology majors, the chemistry majors, and the business and finance majors. I was a psychology philosophy major undergrad. I never took a finance or accounting class ever until I got to business school. And I love being an investor. So that was the plan. And that's what we've been executing on. And look, the firm has, the, the industry has responded. We now have 110 partner firms around the world hiring our women. And this is just going to continue. We have 150 women full-time in our industry in five years working on investment teams right now. And there's hundreds more behind. So we're addressing the pipeline, right? I think many more of us have figured out that now, you know, we need to recruit more diversity in and how can we do that? And we have organizations like Girls Invest and Twigo and SEO and the Greenwood Project and other areas. And that's fantastic. But clearly now we have an issue of how do we keep them in the industry? And we all need to focus on that too. So uh, look, I, I've, I've been encouraged by what I've seen uh, in our industry for the last six years, particularly with uh, what I've done with Girls Who Invest, but we clearly have a long way to go. And, and to the point of the amount of capital that women manage, I mean, I put out a 30 by 30 vision for Girls Who Invest, have 30% of the world's investable capital managed by women by 2030. You've heard the numbers already. I mean, these numbers are low single digits right now. And, and Rupal's a shining star of the incredible talented women we out there, we have out there managing money. And I mean, again, you think about it, more diverse 
teams get better outcomes. We've read all that research. We've actually lived that. I've lived that in my career. And so either firms believe that and they've been moving forward on it, or they don't really believe it yet. And yet their clients are pushing them now and saying, if you don't do it, even though you don't believe it, if you don't do it, I'm going to pull my money from you and I'm going to put it over there. So I think some of the asset owners out there, and Juan and I were talking about this earlier, need to keep pushing a lot of the asset managers and now that's I'm where I am right now, and I think it's great for our industry. Danielle, I, if I if you if I'm a, uh, one second, I just wanted to follow up on on the point that Sima and Jose were making with regards to the market and the question that allocators are doing, or are, or the questions that they're that they're asking. Uh, we just published another study. Um, today uh, that really looked at, uh, that is Knight Foundation did, that, that really looked at the use or the investment uh, by the top 55 uh, foundations, US-based foundations, the investment, their investments with uh, women and diverse owned firms. And what we found was that about six, a little bit more than 16% of their, of their US-based assets were managed by women and diverse owned firms. And so to me, that's not where we wanna be. And I think that there's still significant room for improvement, but it does show to Jose's point about the signal, the market signal that, that asset managers should be receiving that professionally managed, sophisticated endowments are moving dollars are making commitments and we hope that will be at an, at an increasing rate with firms that value diversity uh and so i i, I think that um, in the long run those types of signals uh matter uh but to jose's point this is not the the, the this issue is not an issue that the asset management world has just discovered this is something and as Simo pointed out when she was when she was at New York, this is something that folks have known for a long time, and and they need to be more proactive and intentional in addressing it. Follow up on that one. Um, what are the challenges that are holding back some investors from moving more assets toward diverse managers who are aiming to do so, um, and why isn't the kind of why aren't investors moving more uniformly um, to do this? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll point to three. Um, one, uh, and I'll leave, the, I'll leave uh, my least favorite in the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the last, right? The one is um, uh, an issue of internal uh, processes, to Jose's point, right? Looking at what, uh, what you, your um, allocation criteria are with regards to size of initial investments, how you structure those initial investments. Um, I think that is, uh, in many cases, it's almost like the, the old saying that, you know, you only get credit when you don't need credit. Uh, it's it, 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 Asset allocators sometimes create rules for the way they want to allocate capital where new newer firms or firms that don't have a specific size uh, don't you know, can't qualify basically for, for, for the, the, in those investment criteria. Um, and it, and it, it's interesting because in many cases, asset allocators will say, well, some investment strategies are better or more, are optimal at lower fund sizes. And so it, it's a some way that in some regards, there's a sort of a cognitive dissonance there, right? In that argument, I'd say the, the second thing is that, uh, the, the sort of you're fishing from the same pond, the, the question of how do you find new managers and what is the network of new manager or of, of, um, of that you're looking at, where, where are you trying to find new managers? We constantly say that we're trying to identify uh, new and uncorrelated sources of alpha, uh, but we ask people who have the same exact pedigree to deliver those uncorrelated new returns. Um, and then the last one, as I mentioned, is, is my least favorite of all, is that there continues to be a um, uh, 
sort of in the back of people's minds, this pernicious idea that um, you have to uh, have a concessionary return or accept concessionary returns that come with diversity. Um, statistically, that's been disproven, right? Uh, we, we did in the last study, uh, the, the field-wide study we did in 2019, uh, we asked uh, the, the folks who were conducting this study, Josh Lerner's group, Bella Research, uh, uh, Josh Lerner out of Harvard Business School, we asked them to do some uh, additional statistical analysis on performance of, of diverse owned firms. And what we found uh, was that the firms behaved uh, statistically the same as non-diverse firms. That is, the top quartile performing firms fit right into, if not exceeded, or overrepresented in the top quartile of all firms. And so you, you have this uh, um, pernicious idea that, that well, I, 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 I would love to do this, but I can't afford to uh, give up returns when the evidence points uh, uh, otherwise. And I do wanna jump in on Juan's points because I think he, he hit all three points really well. And I feel pretty passionate about these. In that one is the whole point of again you go back to the process, and you know we we've tried to 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 launch inclusive capital initiatives, and that challenge is is that investment process typically track record might be lacking at times. Typically, there might be earlier stage type of investments. Uh, the structures may not fit in that traditional kind of private equity type of box, so they look different, and you have to kind of reimagine that. So that's that is step one. That's probably in my opinion one of the biggest uh, issues uh, with it, with inclusive capital is, okay, you have to look beyond that in some times and say, okay, how do we evaluate track records differently? Because there's a little bit of the chicken or the egg here in driving this. I think the other one is network because I will tell you, yeah, there are exceptions where we make investments in certain, in certain uh, vehicles that didn't have a track record or had a very unique structure but they came recommended through very reputable sources. And it did, for investment professionals, there's career capital and then there's investment capital. Career capital is says, how do I de-risk this? So nobody says, what in, what the heck were you thinking when you did this? Mm -hmm. Well, those those networks and those recommendations and referrals de-risk a process for, for an investment team very well uh, in, uh, in, in, in doing that. And then the last one is this whole point about returns. And, you know, there's no more annoying question for me when I'm asked, how many basis points are you willing to give up in order to improve diversity? Not a single one. I have a fiduciary duty. I am not willing to give up a single basis point of return to improve our diversity profile. But I also have a strong belief that I don't have to. That by increasing my diversity profile, I keep looking at ESG as a whole. Say, that is an alpha tool. You're mitigating risks. You're bringing in different ideas. Look at like look at your client segments. Look at where demographics are going. Alpha and diversity and is tied together uh, with investment performance, and it's tied together to the bottom line. I think those are these three big points that have kind of slowed down the ability to to, uh, to to improve these numbers. Danielle, let me share my experience with you because you know. Uh, I actually, when I joined Ariel about a decade ago, I actually had a top decile track record. Uh, when I had the track record, people said, well, build your team. Uh, I built my team. Then when I had the team and the track record, they said, oh, well, you're too small for us. <laughs> when we raised some assets, you know, and, and were somewhat successful, then they said, well, now you're too big for us. This is the emerging manager programs. Uh, I mean, this is an industry that has found a thousand ways to say no. Uh, and I will just say that, uh, it is about now creating accountability. It's about creating targets, uh, you know, with defined timelines, uh, because all of these excuses, and I want to underscore, it's really excuses because there are people like me. Uh, just last week, I'm on a nonprofit, 100 Women in Finance, you know, where we try to empower women in finance, in particular, the investment management industry. Uh, and we just hosted a free cap intro uh, fund women week. Uh, conference, you know, for an entire week where we were able to match up, you know, 300 female fund managers, you know, who are looking to get introduced to capital allocators. Uh, and so the talent and the capabilities out there, it's the opportunity that's lacking. 
And I think exactly what Juan and, and frankly, Jose have been saying, the process needs to change, uh, not the expectations in terms of the outcomes. I completely concur. This is not a mutually exclusive proposition, but in order to exceed your DEI objectives, you somehow have to sacrifice your investment return objectives. It's simply not the case. In fact, this is one instance where you can have your cake and eat it too. I think we just need to hold our capital allocators and our customers accountable for moving the needle now. Uh, and frankly, uh, it's not just enough for a capital allocator you know, to say that we want to do this uh, and, and create targets. I think it's exactly what Jose said. You know, Clients are demanding this. So I'm sure in your audience, there are a lot of people who are not capital allocators and who think, well, this is not my problem, it's for someone else to solve. I would say not at all. If you don't speak up, and there are three ways in which you can express uh, you know, your attitude and your desire for more diversity, equity, and inclusion, it's through your voice, uh, ask the questions, uh, make yourself, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the most oil, right? So be that gadfly, ask those tough questions of your uh, money managers and of your capital allocators uh, and your employers as to what they're doing specifically. Uh, then, you know, beyond your voice, express your vote. Uh, there are lots of times, you know, where you can actually vote on these topics uh, in surveys, in, in sort of internal employment engagement surveys or external surveys, uh, you know, express your vote. And then more importantly, uh, vote with your wallet. I mean, move your dollars. And I think that's kind of what capital allocators will pay attention to exactly as Jose said. So I think all of us have to play a role. It's not the responsibility of just the manager, just the process, just the, uh, you know, allocator or just the client. We all have to sort of get the sense of urgency and intentionality around doing something. And just like Seema did, you know, she sort of realized here's the problem and instead of complaining about the problem, she kind of came up with a solution. Uh, we all need to do our bit. I would agree with that, <laughs> yes. And uh, and Rupal, I think you're right. This is an entire industry effort. And that's even how I saw Girls on Best, right? Solving a pipeline issue, getting more diverse talent in the door. It's clearly needed to be an industry-wide effort. And I, I think going back to this idea of allocating capital to women in diverse owned funds and managed funds, you know, I call them constraints. So Jose talked about, you know, you have to have a certain track record, certain level of AUM. Um, Juan, you said the same thing. And, and Rupal, you've lived it, right? So these are constraints, though, that some of the largest U.S. public pension plans put on themselves, right? And, and, and you know, some people call them guardrails, but it's like, no, these are constraints. They have to have a certain uh, three-year track record, at least, right? They have to have a certain level of AUM in order for them to even be considered. And so I actually, before joining Morgan Stanley Investment Management, one of the reasons why I even met Dan Simkowitz, who runs our business, because I started a fund called Seven Step Capital, which was to do day one investing, so seeding women alternative managers who wanted to start their own funds, because New York City had a mandate to invest in women and minority-owned funds. Not every fund out there, not every public plan, not every university endowment and foundation has a mandate specifically, but we did. And uh, we did okay in public equities, investing in that kind of manager, and not so great in public fixed income. And in alternatives, it was like, good luck trying to find them. And again, it wasn't that they weren't out there, like just with Girls Who Invest. They're out there. I knew where all the women were, right? And they're super talented, great pedigrees, great track records, just like Rupal had and has. And yet, you know, when these women think about, hey, you know what? I want to start my own business. Uh, that's what I want to do. I want to be an entrepreneur. I'm ready for that. You know, look at my male counterparts. You know, look at them doing it. I'm as good or better than they are. And they're out there raising capital, you know, but then this is goes to, again, a little bit what Jose was saying in terms of what he's calling, you know, a network. Well, men, they have this great one and, you know, they may not even know the guy, right? So they got introduced. My buddy introduced me to this guy over here and they sit down and they have a coffee together, a lunch together. And this guy across the table may not have even managed money before. Literally, I've seen this happen, right? And and yet, you know, oh, well, I like you and you got good references and you seem like a good guy and kind of grew up in the same town or we played lacrosse together or whatever. And so I'm going to invest $100 million with you and don't worry about it. Don't worry. I'll back you up. I'll be there for you. I'll help you along the way. And we won't pull our money if you sort of stumble a little bit and that kind of thing. Whereas a woman, 
I've seen this, they will have an incredible track record of performance. They'll actually have been managing money for years and have a great track record, and yet they won't get that shot. And so there are biases that, you know, are still here. You know, when you sit across the table, I've heard it from my friends who are out there raising capital, who will sit across the table from allocators of capital, and they'll go through the portfolio. And this woman knows everything about every single position in that portfolio, backwards, forwards, you wouldn't believe it. Right. But yeah, one of the questions gets asked, and they're all men across the table. That's fine. But one of the questions that gets asked across the table is, um, so I realize, you know, you have young kids. Uh, yeah. Uh, so do you go to the office every day? I mean, this is a rock star hedge fund manager who's literally got an incredible track record. And that's a question that an allocator is asking her. You think that he would have asked that of a man? Never. So there are still things going on. And even within that 100 Women in Finance, that's an amazing organization. I love those guys. They gave Girls Invest one of our first grants in the beginning. When they, when you have those kinds of conversations around the table, you'd be amazed at what you hear still to this day, what you hear. So there's there's a lot of undercurrents here that still exist. And, and I would say that the playing field is not level. And, um, and so, you know, one, I would love to have more women be allocators of capital. So part of Girls Who Invest is to put these women in all these positions. And so ideally, there's many more of them sitting across the table. But not just not to say that, you know, women want to invest in women just because they're women. None of us would ever say that. we don't, there's no way. I mean, although I've, I've heard some women actually say that they were nervous about going into their investment committees to present an investment recommendation to invest in a woman because they were afraid the trustees would say, well, you only want to invest with her because she's a woman, right? I mean, can you imagine that? That kind of stuff is still happening. And maybe that's just because there are fewer women out there. I don't know, but to invest in. But, but um, again, a man going in to say to his investment committee, I want to invest with this man. They would never say that. They wouldn't think that that was the thing, right? But yet some women feel that way when they go in to present. And that's just, that's just a shame. And we need to, we need to help fix that too. We've heard a bit about some of the biases and structural impediments to institutional investors allocating more capital with diverse asset managers. Um, one, what strategies have been most effective for investors to get around these? And what are the best practices that institutional investors should be considering to be able to actually move the needle here? So I... I, I, I hesitate to say that we are, that Knight Foundation in particular has a list of best practices, but I can talk a little bit about um, what Knight Foundation did. Um, and and, and, and I'm, within this context, if, you know, if you were to look at the study or to provide a little more context, if you were to look at the study we just published, there's a whole section, a whole appendix in which we give um, each participant in the study an opportunity to discuss how they're addressing issues of diversity and how they, what, what, what are their approaches? We also asked for blog, we have, we're gonna have uh, four blog posts that are gonna be provided at the same time because we know that there are different, the same way that there are different strategies with regards to uh, building a portfolio, there are different areas of focus and different strategies with regards to diversity. But I could say from Knight Foundation's perspective, one of the things that helped us was a first identifying the the level of diversity within our portfolio, the sort of inward facing. We did we we wanted to know where we were and where we started. We looked at our internal processes. That is, as Jose is mentioning, the idea about and, and Sima was just discussing, and Rupal, Rupal was was uh, bringing home. This issue of what are our, what are your criteria constraints associated with how you make and your investment decisions, and making sure that they are not preferences, but rather uh, 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 kind of true uh, true criteria that are necessary, and then for us it was a we we uh, as opposed to other other organizations where a mandate. Is, is vitally important. For us, it wasn't. For us, the mandate was, we want this to be, we want diversity to be an included and important part of the whole investment process. Uh, so that I think was facilitated 
Tasima's uh, earlier earlier example was facilitated by the diversity within our uh, board of trustees and in our C-suite. So for us, the idea of diversity is not a foreign concept. It is the story of the folks who govern and manage the organization. And so we, I think that that is something that helps to facilitate an environment of, of uh, looking outside of the sort of strictures that have been put in place and examining those strictures um, uh, appropriately. So I, I, you know, I, I think that's what's worked with Knight Foundation. And, and for us, it's led us to grow the, the assets under management by uh, minority and women-owned firms from you know, one firm with seven and a half million dollars under management in 2010 to almost 40% of our portfolio today. Um, so nearly a billion dollars uh, of our portfolio being managed by um, women and minority owned firms. And again, quickly, you know, what, what stands out to me, it's really less so about practices because ultimately, look, we know how to invest money and what we look for. It's, it's awareness um, and, uh, and, and transparency, right? Awareness in that this is a bottom line issue. And, um, you know, I could tell you, we, we acquired a manager some years back and it was a team that had been 20 plus year track record. They had been together for all that entire time. And when they came on, we're like, you got to add diversity here because of who we are and the clients we're going to introduce you to. And there was some nodding, but when every RFP looked at their, as Seema said, looked at their org chart and said, we're not okay with this. Yeah, they quickly woke up and were then reaching out to us. You got to help us here because th th these questions are coming in on every RFP that we're getting. The other one is transparency in that, and I'll call out our firm for this. I think, you know, we're a very diverse firm, right? Our parent company, TIA, has, has a black female CEO, one of only two in the Fortune 100. I'm Hispanic CEO of our asset management business and so on. And we'll pat ourselves out. We're doing great. But then when we dug dip, deeper and did a people index or equity index and said, okay, sometimes, you know, it could be, okay, you're doing better with females, but you're not doing as well with people of color and, and, and vice versa. And there's things that mask your numbers that you'll say, oh, we're doing fine. But when you really start peeling the onion, you go, wow, when we look at ourselves, I go, well, how are we doing in terms of, you know, African-American female investment managers, abysmal, like, you know, unacceptable. Yet for a while, we're like, look at all the female managers we have and we're ahead of the pack. We feel pretty good. You peel it back. No, you shouldn't feel pretty good. And sometimes, and this is where the urgency comes in, it is your clients showing up, asking you this question, and your face drops when you really don't have a response to a number that is just so bad. And, you know, Gupal hit on this. This is where it comes. If, if you don't do this well, you're not going to get the capital. And it is those asset allocators. It is those investors and clients that come in pushing that issue that will wake up the industry because it's capitalism at the end of the day. Thanks. Um, so with less than 10 minutes left, I want to pivot the conversation a little bit to look at what asset managers should be doing within their own walls um, to improve these issues. We hear a lot, um, as you mentioned, Jose, about um, companies taking a look and realizing that they're not very diverse in certain areas or that um, there's particular gaps in, um, at an industry level looking at in the portfolio manager ranks as well as executive leadership overall. Um, and one thing that we hear come up a lot is people talking about um, challenges in their recruiting pipeline or not being able to find enough diverse talent. When firms say this, what are they doing wrong? Um, I, I know Seema, you touched on this a little bit in your, in your response to the first question. Um, what are firms doing wrong in the industry when they say they can't find diverse talent? Uh, uh, they're not trying hard enough, right? They're not doing the work. I mean, there are, and there are now organizations out there more so than there were before who are actively doing this and doing it pretty well. So, it, you know, I found, I met someone recently who had never heard of SEO before in our industry. It's like, how can you not know that organization? You know, they've been around for over 40 years and they've been helping get more minorities into our business. Um, and much more broadly, okay, fine, sales, trading, research, investment, banking, but also asset management. And so I, I, just, I, I just think they're not working hard enough. And, um, and again, you know, for, but from my vantage point, I think 
overall, our industry is doing a much better job recruiting more diverse talent in. Um, but I think it's what our industry still has a tough time with figuring out is the then what. You know, once you've recruited all this great diverse talent in, then how do you, you know, develop them, advance them, re retain them, right? That's a, still a huge problem for us as an industry. And that's one of the things I'm focused on at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, being on the senior leadership team there is, is that piece of it. And, um, and if, I, if I feel like we don't do that piece, then we're going to be in the same place where we are today, right? And, and I, even when I think about Girls Who Invest, I would be a total failure if all I did was find these women, we trained them up, we sent them off into the industry and they all left. Right. So very much part of what we're doing as an organization there is we're going to, you know, keep these women in. And how are we going to do that? We have an alumni council. We're building out a great alumni community. We're putting in a lot of continuing education type content and programming into this so that what you experience when you're out of school, five years out, 10 years out, 15 years out is very different. And uh, no one was really with me helping me navigate along the way and how to do that. And so we're going to do that for these women. And that's where we're trying to raise a lot more grant money around that as we as we do that. So that's what we're doing there. But, you know, all of us at our firms need to be doing this inside. It's much easier to manage teams that look the same. That's why many of them didn't want to change, right? It's much harder to manage diverse people, to manage diverse teams. But, but we got to do it because of the benefits, right? I mean, the bottom line benefits of it. Uh, and so, I mean, some of the things that we're thinking about internally and starting to do internally is, yeah, one, you got to start with transparency. What are our numbers? So as Jose was saying, you got to look inside and see what's going on. And, and then again, here's our plan to get better, put out some targets and then really work hard to get there. And so developing all kinds of things internally that are going to help you get there and coming up with new programming. I, I created this thing out of nothing again, like to a girl some fast, but inside of our firm, uh, we started calling it a junior investment talent development program. Well, I, that was not such an inspiring name and I like to name things. So we call it now the Rising Investors Program. And we decided to target those investment professionals on our teams globally at Morgan Stanley Investment Management that are zero to six years of work experience. This is men, women, everybody. That's about 160 investment professionals for us. And I created programming around, and this is an evergreen program. This isn't just a training program and then send them off to their teams and you're done. This is, a, this is an all year round type kind of programming and content. And this is all designed to help this younger talent become more productive, more creative, become better investors, but become happier people and want to stay at MSIM for a long time. And then the other piece is to create more collaboration across our asset classes and our businesses globally, because a lot of these folks don't know each other and not certainly not collaborating with each other. And how do we get that going so that they're also building friendships and relationships and community with their colleagues. Again, so they're happier and stay at MSM a long time. At the core of what we're trying to do in this is, is if we do this right, which I'm counting on we will, that then these folks will stay at MSM for a long time. They'll become more senior, start managing all of our businesses. It then will never seem unusual for a white man colleague to sit across the table for his black female colleague, his Indian woman colleague, his black male colleague. It'll just be how business gets done. And that's how I think you structurally change cultures long term uh, is as, you know, we start young, they bring them in and you develop them and advance them. And, and everybody has to be a part of that conversation. I've seen a lot of places where they just have talent development programs for women and minorities or diverse talents and, they, and it's over here. This is core to us as business and everybody, I think, needs to be involved with that. And I just think the industry, we as an industry, need to do a whole lot more of that so that we have more Rupals who are, you know, going to get to that spot managing, you know, billions of dollars. Seema, if I may, uh, I think I applaud you for what you're talking about and, and creating this pipeline. But, you know, that sort of addresses what I'm going to call a partial supply side issue. I think from a demand side, ultimately allocators, just like you did, you know, at, at your prior firm when you were the CIO, and thankfully you even had the mandate to do it. I think this has to, got to become a compulsion. It's got to become a mandate, you know, for the senior leadership uh, to have X percent of assets managed uh, by diverse owned uh, or women managed firms, et cetera, or, or women in managed portfolios uh, without that compulsion, without that target setting. Uh, I think that uh, what I what I fear is that while people talk about you know recruiting the pipeline, they always focus on recruiting 
at the lowest rungs of the ladder. And, and to be candid, uh, you know, it's very easy then to demonstrate uh, that you're doing something, and I don't mean you, I just mean in, in the industry at large, uh, by recruiting, you know, women and minorities in junior positions, you know, in administrative positions, in clerical positions, uh, as opposed to leadership positions. And unfortunately, you know, hiring at the bottom end of the rung does not move the needle. Uh, it's a start, but it also becomes a source of deflection of the lack of diversity at mid and senior practitioner levels. And I think that we cannot let allocators get off the hook. I work, I mean, I, I'm a board member at 100 Million Finance, and I can tell you, we have 20,000 followers on LinkedIn. These are all practicing women, mid-career, senior career, uh, you know, been in the industry, lacking the opportunity. I mean, if people have a job posting, just give it to us. If you can't find the talent, we'll find it for you. So there are resources out there. If people are intentional, uh, there is no uh, supply side challenge uh, that can't be figured out here and now. We don't have to wait uh, because just as delayed is just as denied. So I would just say uh, allocators wake up. This is a call to action. Set the targets, mandate them, you know, have a very defined timeline. And we are all here to help you get there. Thank you. And we are about out of time for today, um, but I don't want to cut this panel short on this important topic. Uh, Jose, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, you know, I, I understand we're, we're out of time. I would just say, look, the bottom line is you, you hear this story that there's not enough town. The pool is thin. The pool is large enough. I mean, it, it's not, or put it this way, so at the very least, when you look at the talent pool that's out there relative to the diversity that's in place, there's a big mismatch. And it is around thinking differently looking at different areas to uh, to fish. Uh, you know, like Seema mentioned, affiliations like SEO. I'm a board member and a fellow alum at Twigo, for example. And I could, again, I'll look at our firm. We engage with Twigo SEO through giving money and, and speaking and engaging with students. And then when you would follow up with this amazing talent pool, there was a disconnect with our HR teams of, why are we not capturing a return on our capital? Uh, of, of investing in these firms and dry, drawing in that pool. So there's an example, like the pool's in front of you. You're already engaging with the organization and these organizations are still underpenetrated at the firms who are actually giving money and supporting it and going to the galas and the like. Thank you all for joining us for this panel. Please stay tuned for the next one, which will explore how the hunt for yield will shape product development and investment strategies.